Let's do this. This is the Kamunda Cloud getting started for Kotlin and Spring. I'm your host, Josh Wolf. I am a developer advocate at Kamunda and I have no idea what I'm doing. So that makes two of us. Let's do this together. Now I'm assuming as a prerequisite that you have a JDK JVM installed and that you have an IDE. I'm using IntelliJ, but you can use whatever you like. Now I'm gonna be following these instructions here, which you can find in the Kamunda Cloud documentation. First thing we're gonna do, we're going to download a Maven Spring Starter from here. So here's one that we prepared earlier. This is a pretty easy. We just click on Generate. It downloads. I'm going to open that up. And I'm going to unzip the Cloud Starter. Let's have a look here. Extract into Other Folder. So I'm going to put it into uh, Workspace, Kamunda, and I have a scratch area where I do this kind of stuff. So scratch, we'll put it in here, extract here. There we go, that was easy. So if we go and have a look here at my command line, I can see that I now have a cloud starter uh, directory here. So I'll cd into cloud starter, and then I'll start my IntelliJ IDE. All right, here it comes, IntelliJ IDEA Community Edition. Uh, you can get the professional edition, which has some uh, extra stuff in it, like a support for JavaScript. If you're doing like full stack coding, I'm just using the community edition, which works fine for Kotlin Java development on the back end. We're going to be making a, uh, a web server based. Let's not worry about these. Uh, how do I tell this to do it later? No, we'll just get rid of that. Okay. We're in the project. So first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to, Synchronize my Maven dependencies just to make sure that I have everything that I need. So dependencies, synchronize. And we're going to add the Spring ZB client dependency. So I can just copy and paste this dependency block here, open the pom.xml, and then paste it in here as a dependency. There we go. And then I'll synchronize my dependencies again. This is going to download the Spring ZB starter dependency into my project. So we should see it appear in this list of dependencies, and there it is. That was pretty easy. Okay, next step, we're going to log into Kamunda.io, Kamunda Cloud. Now, if you don't have an account, you'll be able to open one from this, uh, create an account from this link. I have an account, so it's just going to maybe log me in, or I might have to log in. Let's have a look here. So this is currently being served from Europe West 1D region, I believe. Yeah which is in uh, Belgium. So if you're in Europe, it's going to be a lot faster than if you're anywhere else in the world. And I'm going to delete this cluster because we're going to create it from scratch. Uh, it will get faster as time goes by once it starts getting served from a CDN. Okay, we're going to create a new cluster. So we're just going to call it uh, Spring Starter. Spring Starter. Development Free Beta ZB0233. Add. Give it a second or so, and it'll appear here in my cluster console. And you can see it's got a red dot. It says creating. So it's being provisioned into Kubernetes right now. Now, while that's happening, I can create a uh, client connection credentials. That's kind of like an API key. So I'm going to create a new key, and we'll call it Cloud Starter. This is a human readable name. doesn't really make any difference except for you to identify your uh, client connection credential configurations. Cool. I've got a client ID. I've got a client secret and connection information. So I can copy that entire block and then I'm going to put it into source main resources application dot properties. Good. We can get rid of this. First thing that we need to do because these are bash environment variables. So we're going to get rid of these and we need to take off these apostrophes as well. So we don't need those. Okay, we don't need the ZB authorization server URL line. And we need to change these keys here. But luckily, we have them here. So we need to get the ZB client cloud cluster ID. Now, because this is just the cluster ID, it's not the fully qualified domain name and port. So we can take that part off. Now, I've opened a, uh, an issue for the spring client. No, for the Kamunda Cloud Console, so that you'll be able to copy and paste this block. Uh, just like I got those bash, the bash environment variables, you'll be able to copy a spring configuration, which will be awesome. 
Okay, and then there's one extra one that I need to add, which is this client worker default name. So we'll put that in. Um, I've opened an issue to have a default for the default name so that you don't have to do that. Whatever's kind of a weird name, so we'll call it um, worker. All right, there we go. We now have uh, the configuration ready to roll. So now we're going to test the connection with Kumunda Cloud. So our Cloud Starter application class is in main Kotlin IO Kumunda Cloud Starter Cloud Starter application. And we are going to annotate it with mm, enable ZB client. Could be. Yeah, enable ZB client. There we go. So this is going to, uh, you know, this annotation adds the, the ZB Spring functionality to the application. So we're going to auto wire a private property and this is going to inject a reference to the ZB client into the application so that, you know, in our code, we can use that client to communicate with the cluster. Now, one thing that I've got to do here is add some braces because we are expanding this class. Nice. Okay. Now, because we're building a, like a, a REST powered kind of um, application, we're going to add the REST controller annotation to our application. That enables us to, you know, it starts a, a Netty server and we can just create annotated um, mappings, routes. So control dot, import. Good. Now we're going to create a mapping for status. I'm just going to copy it. So this is a, a, a get route get status and what it does is it uses our injected client let's just make sure that we import that what it does is it uses our injected client reference uh, it calls the new topology request method creates a new topology request for the cluster sends it and then it calls join which makes it synchronous because the send by itself will return a future but we want like to get the result now and then we just call the to string method on the topology response so this really should be called topology response. 80% of programming is uh, debugging and the other 50% is choosing the correct names. So there we go. That's a better name, I think, like that. Okay, so if I go to my terminal, we should be able to run this and this should just work TM. Maven Spring Boot run. I got it. Thank you for that. Okay, this is going to start uh, the spring application assuming that I did everything correctly and that it compiles okay and it's going to start a web server on localhost 8080 and that that web server is going to have a route on status where when I get that route with HTTP get no nope, it's an error it's going to get the topology response but we've missed something out let's have a look 80% of programming is debugging Unable to define a suitable main class, please use a main class property. Mm hmm. Okay, let's have a look. What have I done? Was it because I added these? That doesn't seem right. Let's try it. Nope. Okay, Spring Boot run. Unable to find, maybe, um, no, okay, that was it. So I was mistaken there. I did not need to add those braces. There we go. So we started the cloud application. So let's open another tab, and here we'll go to localhost 8080, and we want to get the status endpoint. No configured view. Interesting. Let's try adding these back in. 80% of programming is debugging. Let's try rebuilding that. And I'll also go back here and check this. Spring Boot application, enable ZB client, REST controller. Yeah, looks okay. Attaching agents. It's funny, I wonder why it failed the first time. I'm at a loss to explain it. Maybe I forgot to hit save, could be. Okay, let's go back here. Localhost 8080 status. Let's try getting that point. Waiting for localhost, it says down the bottom. Boom, there we go. Here's the topology response from the broker cluster in Kamunda Cloud. I've got like a single node in my cluster. Cluster size one, one partition, one replication factor. 
there's the version there and the version of the broker and uh, what else is interesting here you've got the this host name here is the kind of fully qualified domain name for the kubernetes resolution but at least what we can see here is that we've made the connection and we were able to make a query for some information cool let's move on to the next step so we're going to create a bpmn model now a business process model and notation so to do that we're going to use the zb modeler which is a, an Electron application. So you can download it from the ZD, ZB Modeler releases page on GitHub. 091 is the latest release at the time that I'm making this video. And you can see here you've got like Linux, Mac, and Windows 32-bit and 64-bit versions. So I already have it downloaded on my machine. So I'm just going to go ahead and pull that up. Now we're going to create a new BPMN diagram. We've got to start um, event here. So I'm going to, let's make it a little bit bigger so you can see it. Okay, this here is our start event. We're going to add a task and then add an end event, which we'll call end. Amazing, 50% of programming, choosing the right names, winning already. Now this task here, we're gonna make it a service task. So we click on this little spanner wrench icon and choose service task. We're gonna name this service task get time. And over here in my properties panel, which unfortunately I cannot make any uh, larger, we're going to make the type get dash time. Now the task type in here is kind of like a subscription or a topic. It's how workers know which tasks they're serving. Now if I click on the, so when I click on the service task, I get the properties for the service task. And if I click in the blank area of the canvas, I get the properties for the whole model. And so in here, I can give it an, a, an, a, an ID and a name. So I'm going to call it test process. And the name I'm going to give it is test process. There we go. And then I'm going to save that into source main resources yeah in there and i'm going to call it test dash process i tend to name my my uh file names of my models after the same name as the id it makes it easier for me to remember and to map them you know conceptually so if i go back to my ide i can see now that my test process is here in the resources folder so to deploy it into the cluster is quite simple using the spring client all i need to do is annotate my application with this zb deployment annotation and i give the class pass res class path resources uh, parameter which is made up of an array of you know uh, models that i want to deploy so we've got just one so we'll just put that in there okay let's try running that again there's not really much to see here when we run this um, you'll just see something at the console telling us that the model has been deployed as the application starts. It's going to take a sip of water while that's happening. Product, product placement. Uh, so you can see it going past there. Here it is right here. It says deployment, ZB deployment value, and this is my deployment event, you know, or deployment request response. Okay, great. Um, to really see something though, we want to start an instance of this, um, of this model, of this uh, workflow definition. So starting a workflow instance, pretty simple. We're going to create another route in our application, this time on the start, start route. All right. So what we do here in this route is we use the client reference again to construct a new create instance command. So we're creating a new workflow instance. We specify the BPM and process ID test dash process. And you know, we got that from right here, the ID of the model itself. We're going to use the latest version. Then we send the command to come onto cloud and we join that so that we get the response back synchronously. And then we're going to return again, to string a string version stringified version of that response okay so if we now restart our application we're going to end up with an application that has two routes it has a status route and it has a start route where we can start the workflow instance so it takes about 
once once the spring once the compilation's finished and spring starts, it takes about three to four seconds for the whole thing to start up. And it will take a bit longer actually because it needs to do the deployment. 5.3 seconds. Now it does the deployment every time that it starts, but it's idempotent. So if I haven't changed the model between deployment uh, commands, it won't create a new version. It'll stay at version one. Now, if we go into a browser and say start, I'm going to hit that endpoint. There you go. Create workflow instance response. And we've got the workflow key, which is the workflow definition key. Uh, we got the, the BPMN process ID of the process that was started, or the, the workflow model, the definition, the version of the workflow definition that we used. And here's the unique workflow instance key for identifying this particular workflow instance. Now, what we can do here is we can go back to Commando Cloud. And oh, I actually want to go into my spring starter. So I'll go into the cluster. Now, in the cluster details overview, down the bottom here, you can see workflow instances, view and operate. Now, operate is the visualization component for Commando Cloud and for ZV. If I click on view and operate, it's going to open the operate user interface in my browser. It's running on a different uh, pod, uh, different node in Kubernetes. And what happens is the broker exports all the events that happen into Elasticsearch and then operate reads Elasticsearch to get the running state of the cluster. So you can see here we have one running instances in total. So if I click here, one instance in one version, you can see this is an aggregated view. If I had 10 instances running, I would see, you know, the aggregate of them all. We've got one, so let's we'll click into that instance. And here we are. So we have one running instance and it's sitting here at the get time task. It's waiting for a worker to service that the, the job for that task. A job is like a specific concrete instance of a task in a workflow instance. So let's create a worker to service this task. Now to do that, we just need to annotate another method of our class with the ZB worker annotation. And we specify the task type that this is going to poll for with the type um, annotation parameter. So copy and paste. I can just drop that in there like that and save that. Uh, import some dependencies. Uh, 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 and then also logger.info. Um, just to make things easier, I might just make that system system out.print line. There we go. So our worker is, when, when the application starts, it's going to start a worker. The worker is going to poll the Kamunda Cloud um, continuously. So it polls and then it's a long poll. So it waits. It says, do you have any jobs of type get time for me? And then it waits. And then the broker will either after some time say, hey, I timed out for that. And it will ask again. Or when the broker has some work for that task type, a job or jobs of that task type, it'll stream them back to the worker. Now the worker handler will then receive It'll be called multiple times, once for each job that it gets. And it gets a client reference uh, injected into it. I mean, we have our client reference already for the class, but the handler gets one, which is handy because it means you can extract these out into different files. And inside our worker handler, all we're going to do is we're going to print out the, the activated job that the worker has received. That gives you an idea of what your worker has to work with. And then we're going to send back a new complete command. We're going to get the key, the, that workflow instance key from the from the from the job, so that the broker knows which one is being completed. Send it and join it. Okay, let's run this. So what we should expect to see happen when we run this is that the worker will start, and it will get that job that's waiting in Commando Cloud right now, and it will print out the job data slash metadata to the console. So we that's what we should expect to see in the terminal once once the application starts up. So here we go, should take about five seconds for this part to complete. Here we go, activated one jobs for worker worker and job type get, get time. So here's the data that the worker receives and has to work with. You got custom headers. Um, usually the things you work with are the custom headers, the variables and variables as map. So if we go back to operate now and take a look at what's happening, operate instance, you can see here that this process instance that we created earlier is now finished. It's flowed all the way to the end. Let's start another one just to 
see the whole thing happen. So I started one. You can see here the workers serviced the task that we had. And if I go back to operate and go to running instances. Now, interestingly enough, under running instances, you can choose finished instances. And we see there are two finished instances here. I can also do it like this. Now this is the aggregator view here. You can see it says two, two workflows are at that completed end event. And I can drill down into them here. Okay, so you know we've created a, a cluster. We've created a client connections credential connected to the cluster, um, got the topology from it. We've created a model, deployed it to the cluster, and created instances of workflows of that using that model. And then we've created a worker to service a task in the model. What we're going to do now is we're going to add decisioning into the model, make it a little bit more complex. Actually, no. Before we do that, what we'll do is in this get time task, we'll make a call out to a rest service. That's what we'll do first. So in here, what we're going to do is we're going to use Spring's rest template. Um, oh no, first, before we do that, we're going to create and await the, the outcome of the workflow. So here's the thing about this is when we start the workflow instance, it's kind of like asynchronous. So it started and it's finished, but I mean, how do we get information about the ultimate outcome of the workflow? You know, like if, if you imagine if the workflow is something like, um, you know, do all the things necessary to say whether or not a loan application should be approved. We really want to know whether the loan application should be approved or not at the end of that process in our application. So we can do that by adding in here um, in the builder pattern, we can add the with result. Nope. Now the reason for that is that the type of this, uh, 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 nope, there's no type there. Okay. New create instance command. It's a different type of command that we need to create. Create instance with result. No, it's not there. It is, it is actually dot with result. I'm pretty sure about that. new create instance command. Eh, okay, with result doesn't work. Uh, underneath latest, dun, dun, dun. underneath latest version. There, 80% of programming is debugging. Okay, well, uh, okay, so interesting. So you can chain all the different things into the builder pattern, but they have to be in the correct um, order. So 80% of programming is debugging, the other 50% is choosing the right names, right? And then the, the last 20% is just copying, pasting the correct um, code snippet from Stack Overflow. So let's rename this. So this is a workflow instance event, but it's a workflow instance with result. And it's not even really an event. It's more just a workflow instance with result, right? I could have done a refactor on that, but I'm old school. I like, I like to type. Workflow instance with result. Client, it's going to run the whole workflow. It's going to get the result back. And so let's just run that through now so that you can see that what that does. So what we should expect to see here science is all about making predictions is instead of getting a create workflow instance response, we should see the final outcome of the workflow returned uh, from this rest endpoint. So another three or four seconds as it starts up in the background. Okay, so let's call that rest endpoint. There we go. Create workflow instance with result response. Now, really the only difference between this one and the create workflow instance response response is the addition of this here, the variables field, which is the, the variable payload of the workflow. Now, because our worker really does nothing, the variables are just empty at the end of the workflow. So let's populate those variables so we can see what that looks like. And we're going to do that by calling a REST API in the worker. So in here, we're going to call a REST API using Spring's REST template. And I have a, a, an API that you can use for testing stuff out, json-api.joshwolf.com forward slash time, and it returns a JSON object with the current time GMT. 
So I'm just going to copy this part here. 20% of programming is knowing which code sample to copy. So in the worker here, we replace the implementation of the worker. We need to import the rest template. So here we go. What we do is the job gets called. We do a, a, an HTTP GET request onto this API. And then we add the result of that rest request into the variables in the complete command. So it's going to enrich the payload, update the payload of the workflow as it goes through. Okay, so let us now run that. So what we should expect to see this time is that when we start a new instance, awaiting the result of it, that it's going to come back and variables here of that workflow will be populated with the GMT time from uh, from the API. Okay, did that start? Let's check. Main started. Yes. Okay, here we go. This is going to take a little longer for it to complete because it has to do a rest call in the middle. And there you go. So we've created an instance of the workflow, waited for the result, and in that workflow, a worker has gone and got the time over a REST API and added it to the payload, and we can now see that. We get that back. That's pretty cool. Let's have a look at it in come on to operate. Finished instances. Let's refresh that page. It looks like if you're looking at an individual instance, it updates dynamically. If you're looking at the aggregated view, you have to refresh it. So the latest one is this one here. And then you can see here we have the final variable payload in, in available and operate as well. Okay, now let's add some decisioning logic to the to the, the model. So I'm going to let's get rid of the end event. And then from here, we're going to add a decisioning gateway, an exclusive XOR gateway. And then it's going to have two branches, two different paths that it can take. Just like that Led Zeppelin song. Drop that one in there. Mm, bring that down. Okay, good. And then we'll add the end event, which we'll put in the middle. And then we'll connect both of these things to it. Beautiful. Let's add that name back in. End. Okay, two service tasks in the middle, two different branches that it can take. What we're going to do is we're going to branch based on the time of day. So let's start with the, uh, the branching piece. So to do the branching conditions, we add them to these um, connectors here. So I give this one a name and we'll say um, is before noon for this one. Move this up to here. And on this one, we're going to say is afternoon. Is afternoon. Nice. So two different pathways that it can take. To put the condition itself on, we add it in the condition expression. And this uses feel, the friendly enough expression language. So I have the expression that we're going to be using down here. So what we're going to do is we're going to examine the time key of the variable payload. And then we're going to examine the hour sub key. Uh, yeah, I found a bug in this actually the other day, which I will fix now. Logic error. Um, so we'll put that in there. Equals time dot hour is greater than or equal to zero. And time dot hour is less than or equal to. And that should be 11 rather than 12. Otherwise, it'll go all the way to 12.59 p.m. Thinking that it's before noon. Logic error. So that's the condition for this pathway. Now for the other pathway, you know, we could try to create another condition expression to deal with the, you know, the excluded case, but we don't have to do that. We can instead just say, this is the default flow. So if this condition is met, take this pathway. Otherwise, take this pathway. It's kind of like a case statement, a switch statement with a default. Now what we're going to do here is we're going to, again, click on that little wrench and turn this to a service task. These are going to be two service tasks. Now these service tasks here, we're going to make a greeting because we're going to say good morning or good afternoon. So this one here will say uh, good morning. These, these are just the human readable names and good afternoon. Good afternoon. Human readable names. And we're going to make them of the same task type. So we're going to write one worker that can service both of these different cases because effectively it's doing the same thing. 
it's making the greeting, but you can see that that's the kind of thing that you would parameterize as a function, right? So similar kind of way we make a, a specializable worker. Uh, so the type here we're going to call make-greeting. Same thing for this one, make-greeting. Now we're going to get the specialization of the behavior in the worker by passing in a custom header. Remember I said earlier that the, the two main things you work with in the worker are the variables and the custom headers. So we can add a custom header to specialize the behavior of this particular task. So I say add header, I add a key greeting, and the value for that greeting is good morning. And then for good afternoon, same thing, add a custom header, key is greeting, and then the value is good afternoon. Like that. Boom. Love it. Okay, that should be everything that we need to do here for the process. So if I save that diagram, I'm going to restart my application so that it does the redeployment. And because I've modified the model, this time my automatic deployment via the spring annotations is going to create, an, the, the broker will create a new version for the model and it will be version 2 for the workflow definition. And the next thing that we need to do is, well, let's just run it and we'll start an instance. That'll be fun. And then we can see it stop at the gateway. Okay, starting and started. Okay, so let's, uh, actually, uh, if I run this and, and have it stop at the gateway, I'll show you that as well. I'm going to get a timeout error because when you create a workflow instance and await the result, it's like a 15 second timeout by default and you can change that. Let, let's change that now. Um, oh man, you guys are getting some extra content that, uh, let's have a look with timeout. No, okay, it must have to go before the with result. Try it here. Try it here. Nope. What about here? What about here? Workflow key, BPMN process ID, with results, fetch variables, request timeout. That's the one I'm looking for. Request timeout. So in here, uh, I think I've got to use a duration. Um, how long is it going to take me to do this next section so that I don't want it to time out in the meantime? Let's give it 30 minutes. That's pretty easy. Like that. So now what happens is um, I'm more likely to have my browser timeout before then. Um, okay, let's restart that. Obviously, that's parameterizable. So, you know, different routes, different um, workflows can, you know, you, you're, you have an expectation that this thing should be completed within 30 minutes. And if it's not, that's like an error condition. We need to deal with that. Okay. Uh, 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 deployed and started. So here I can click on create a new instance. That's not coming back because my workflow is not going to finish. And I'll show you why. You probably already, you probably already guessed why it's not going to finish. So running instances, let's refresh this page. See, so we have one running instance there. Ah, come back, come back. We have one running instance of version two, right? So let's click into here. And you can see that, you know, it's gone through, it's got the rest time from the rest API. It's made the decision. It's before noon in uh, London. So it's gone to the good morning task, which is the get Oh, sorry, the make greeting task, but there's no worker servicing that task, so it's just sitting there waiting. Let's create that. Let's create that um, worker. Actually, when I when I rebuild my application in order to get this worker to deploy, I'm going to lose my uh, connection here. This is going to reset. Anyway, whatever. So here we create this worker. I'm just going to copy and paste. 20% of programming is knowing which code sample to copy and paste from Stack Overflow or from the README or from the documentation. That's why writing great 
cut and paste code samples in documentation is like a key. Okay, we create a new ZV worker. The type for this one is make greeting. And in here you see what we do is we grab the headers, the custom headers from the job that gets passed in. Then from those headers we get the greeting key. Put it into here and then we grab the, the variables from the payload as a map and then we get the name out of the variables and then we construct a templated string that says greeting name, good morning, good afternoon and then we complete it and put that greeting into the say uh, key in the payload. So the other thing we need to do here is we need to put the name into the variables. Uh, so we can do that by making our map in our mapping for start we need to set some variables. Variables. Now variables is a um, JSON object, stringify JSON. So we're going to lovingly handcraft some JSON here. So the first thing that we do is name. And let's use my name. It's easy for me to remember. Josh Wolf. Difficult for me to remember or even to know what your name is. So we'll go with mine like that. There we go. Handcrafted JSON object name Josh Wolf that puts that into the initial variables of the of the workflow. Save that, stop the application, and restart. Mm -mm -mm. What did it not like about that? Yeah, that was what I thought it would be, which is this connection resetting. If a workflow completes and no one is listening to the result, does it make a sound? It does in operate in the Elasticsearch. Okay, we started, activated one job. So if we go back to operate, we'll see here that this is now completed. And if we have a look at the final payload, uh, 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 end, good morning. Start test process. You can see here it says say and it says good morning there. There was no name in the in the workflow payload, so it used the default. No one received that though because this thing's not listening anymore. But you can see the, the result here in, uh, in in operate. So let us now start an instance. It's gonna start an instance, it's gonna run through, and here we have the output and it's in the say key of the workflow. Good morning, Josh Wolf. It's a hello world example. Um, one thing that we can do here just to make it a little bit more kind of clean is here we can say val um, response maybe. Output outcome. Say outcome uh, output equals. So from the workflow instance with results, I can get the variables as a map and then I can say get or default and then I'm going to ask for the say key and if I didn't get one I'll just say um, let's go Aussie g'day save that and here rather than outputting that whole thing we're just going to output output stop the application uh, what does it not like about that oh you should inline it okay wow Cast output to string. That's oh, add to string. There we go. It's better. Run. Dun dun dun. Okay, so what we should expect to see this time is just the value of this variable here. Starting, starting, starting. Another three or four seconds for it to start. So now if I click reload, did I jump the gun? No, it's going, there we go. Good morning, Josh Wolf. And there you have it, a hello world exercise using BPMN and come onto cloud with Kotlin and Spring. You know, we created a cluster in come onto cloud. Uh, we created client connection credentials for it. We connected to that cluster programmatically from Spring Kotlin and got the status of the cluster. We then created a model in the ZB modeler and deployed it into the cluster. Uh, we started an instance of a workflow using that model and viewed it in operate. 
and then we added a worker for that model and we added the ability for that worker to, to get something over rest from an API, add it to the payload. We added a decisioning gate and then we added another worker which specializes its behavior based on custom headers. So this gives you a real kind of uh, easy way to get started with Commander Cloud and an idea of some of the things that you can do with it. Uh, go to the documentation for more examples and look out for more tutorial videos. Enjoy.